Hi, I'm Rena Vebeck and I'm the Education Coordinator with Lakehead Region Conservation Authority. I'm here at Hazelwood Lake today and I'm just here in the parking lot getting ready to get started for our virtual field trip and I'm excited to have you here with me. Let's get started. So we're headed down the path towards Hazelwood Lake and I wanted to introduce you to what the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority is. Um, we're a community-based environmental agency responsible for the wise management of renewable natural resources in our watershed. We actually encompass eight member municipalities. That means a whole bunch of municipalities and townships are part of the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority and within our watershed. Our vision is a healthy and safe, sustainable Lakehead watershed for future generations like yourselves. And our mission is to lead the conservation and protection of the Lakehead watershed. So my job here at the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority is the education coordinator. That means I get to do all the amazing field trips with students of all ages and um, take them out to wonderful places like Hazelwood Lake or other conservation areas. I'm just heading down towards Hazelwood Lake here, as you would if you were on one of our field trips. Um, other places within our conservation authority include um, Mills Block and um, Wishheart Forest, which are forest management properties. And then we also have several other properties, perhaps you've been to some of them, Cascades, uh, Mission Island Marsh, um, Herkett Cove, Little Trout Bay, and I'm forgetting a few right now, but what I'd encourage you to do is head to our Lakehead Region Conservation Authority website with your parents. Take a look at um, our conservation areas listed there, how to get there, take a look at some maps, and make a plan to head out whenever it's best for you and your family to enjoy one of these conservation areas. That's the Hazelwood Lake Beach area. And if we look over here, we can look out into the large water expanse of Hazelwood Lake on this beautiful June day, hoping to beat the rain for this field trip. But it smells wonderful because it has been raining over the past couple of days. and. Hopefully you can hear the birds chirping who are very happy. When you're at one of our Conservation Authority areas, make sure you drop your $2 into the coin box or you can always go and buy one of our Explorer cards through our website. And then you have one for the whole year to visit any conservation area you want. And it helps support the um, upkeep of our conservation areas. While you're watching the virtual field trip today, I want you to get out a piece of paper and see if you can write down all the things that you hear, see, and experience while on this virtual field trip. Right now I'm hearing some birds around me. Maybe you can also see some of the insects around me. There's of course lots of plants. Keep track and see how many different kinds of species you can see today. While we're here today and enjoying the beautiful trails of Hazelwood Lake, it's a good reminder that whenever you come to a natural area, it's important to stay on the trails so that you don't wreck habitat that is important for all the living things in this area. We also make sure that any plants that are growing, we leave intact enjoy them, take a picture of them. Um, if they've fallen on the ground, sometimes we can collect them for different projects or out of interest, but otherwise we leave them intact. It's also important that if you see wildlife, which is so exciting, let's enjoy it from a distance, um, respectful distance where the animals are not scared away, um, including birds. We're gonna make sure that we always pick up and take away any garbage that we've brought with us to not leave behind. And when we're collecting our um, 
aquatic invertebrates that we're, we're hiking towards right now, we're going to make sure that they're out of the water only for a very short time and get them right back in the water. And of course, we will be returning them back to their water homes when we're finished. We're going to tread carefully and gently. And if anyone else is around, we're going to be respectful of their space too and not be too loud. As we often like to say when we're visiting, leave only footprints and take nothing but pictures. As I'm hiking over to our pond area, I was so excited to come across this huge white pine. Look way up. It is loving its big space up there, collecting lots of sunshine. And this beautiful white pine is growing so happily here amongst cedar trees. Here I have the cone of the white pine and the needles. Now these are older needles, so they've turned red instead of green. But you can see that they're in bunches of five. And what's great about identifying a white pine with its five long needles is that the word white has five letters in it. And they have five needles. So the white pine has five needles in its bunch. A nice long resinous cone and the rough bark of the white pine mature tree with some great lichens growing on it as well. Here are the scales of a cedar tree. You can see they lie flat, similar to needles, but they are scales and the nice fibrous cedar bark. And we'll look up at the tree. There's many cedar trees in this area. They like the wet soil close to the lake. I just love these blue beaded lilies that I'm walking past along the trail. They've got these long, smooth leaves and a tall stalk with yellow flowers at the top. And in about a month, they'll have blue beads at the top, almost like a, a large, dark blueberry right here at the top. But don't eat them, they are poisonous, but they're just beautiful plants in our area and they also like wet areas. Today we're headed down the Forest Community Trail and we're going to head over to where number two and three are located on this map, um, right around the wetland and we're going to take a look at pond life in there. So we're excited to head down the Forest Community Trail. I'm so excited to show you guys. I came across this muddy area along the trail and I thought I'd take a look, a closer look for any kind of paw prints. Now, of course, I see human prints and, and dog prints. We can see a, a dog print right here. And there are boot prints, but right back here, I was so excited to see a small bear print here in the mud. You can see it was headed in this direction. And then over on this side, on the side of the trail, I see some deer prints, a small deer also headed in this direction. You can see that its toes connect and then splay out. So always keeping our eyes out for what we might see along the way while we're exploring. And of course, still listening for those wonderful birds. Don't know if you could hear that one. It was the oven bird. As an oven gets warmer and warmer, so too does the oven bird's song get louder and louder. And it says over and over again, Teacher, 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 teacher. And it gets louder and louder. There it is. Over in this direction. I'm arriving here at the wetland slowly because I don't want to scare any birds or animals that might be around. Perhaps uh, turtles sunning themselves on logs or rocks. Frogs 
just in the shallow waters or maybe even a blue heron fishing in the shallows. So I've set up a little station to investigate what we might find here in the wetland. I'm going to use my nets. I've got a large net and a small net and I'm going to be searching through the water a little bit into the mud to see what invertebrates will find and invertebrates mean they don't have a vertebrae or a backbone. So that includes things like insects, snails, leeches. We'll see what we can find and then we're going to see if we can identify them. Here in my net I've caught a frog. I'm going to keep it submerged in the water because frogs partially breathe through their skin and also through their lungs. If you remember from your frog life cycle in class, the frogs lay eggs which then hatch and turn into tadpole, tadpoles and tadpoles breathe through their gills like fish and then they slowly transform through metamorphosis into a frog becoming a froglet first with their legs and losing their tail and this is a mature frog so it breathes through its lungs but also can breathe by absorbing air through its wet skin and they do that in the winter they bury down into the mud at the bottom of, of um, wetlands or where the mud is wet and they go below the ground where it will freeze and they stay there all winter slowing down their their breathing and their heart and they absorb a bit of oxygen through their skin and they stay in a sort of hibernation all winter. So I, it was nice to see this little frog here today. We'll let it go. It's ready to go. So here I've collected two dragonfly nymphs. So they are immature dragonflies that will um, soon metamorphosize and become adult dragonflies that we see flying around and as we love them because they eat our, our black flies. Uh, and we figured it out by using this really nice dichotomous key. Dichotomous means two choices, really. So every question, you're given two choices. And we started over here. It didn't have a shell, but it did have legs. So we went down. And if we look again at our dragonfly nymph, it has three pairs of legs. So three pairs of legs, yes, but no wings. No wings yet and no tail. Also had bulging eyes. So there it is, the dragonflies. We'll take another look at the two we've got here. They're staying very still. We'll be sure to put them back into the wetland when we're done. And over here, we found two snails. These were pretty easy to identify using our dichotomous key. Did it have a shell? Yes. So there it is. Snails. And you can see they're moving around using what's called their foot, which is the, um, the part of their muscle that sticks out of their shell to move them around. Here we've caught a damselfly nymph. You can see it moving a little bit. It also has three pairs of legs, um, but it has a tail, an elongated tail, which means a longer tail, and it has three ends, three ends to the tail. So that helped us using our dichotomous 
key. And there we are with damselflies. Damselflies look a lot like dragonflies when they're adults, but um, there's some slight differences and maybe um, if we see an adult one we can do some comparisons or uh, you can take a look for some pictures of them. I have here with me a dragonflies and damselflies uh, pocket brochure um, field guide and it's got all kinds in there and I love that inside it compares the two dragonflies and damselflies and how they're different and if we look um, when they're perched when the adult is perched let's say on a twig the dragonflies rest with their wings open whereas a damselflies damselfly um, has its wings folded um, and you can see here the difference in the uh, the picture just below this dragonfly is really hard to see. We've had another one land right here. Maybe you can see it better. See how when they're resting, their their wings are out, um, as opposed to a damselfly, which will rest with its wings up. They're also very strong flyers and can glide, whereas the damselfly has to um, beat its wings quite often to keep flying. Here on the surface of the water, we can see some water striders. They're so great. They spread their legs. Their legs are spread so wide that they're able to stay on top of the water without sinking. When we take a look at the vegetation around the wetland, we see some great species that we're probably a little familiar with. Here right on the edge we have a willow species with their long oval shaped leaves. We have alders over here and all these shrubs like to have their roots wet. You can see they're growing right into the wetland. Out in the water we see some, some pencil reeds and even out there I think I see the start of some lily pads growing um, that will get bigger throughout the summer season. These vegetation are so important to the animals that live around the water's edge and in the water. They use it for camouflage. Camouflage is a way that animals protect themselves from predators by hiding. Frogs are very good at this. They dive under the water and they're similar color to either the mud that they're hiding in or um, the vegetation that surrounds them. In order to see these camouflaged animals, we have to watch very carefully. And if you get the chance, sit for five minutes by a water's edge and you'll start to see and hear the animals, they'll become more comfortable with you being there. Especially in the evening when the frogs start calling. And if you love frog calls as much as I do, I encourage you to go to Frog Watch, which is a website. And they have the pictures of frogs and they also have the sounds that they make. And you can listen to the sounds or the calls that they make, just like bird calls. And you can find out more about your favorite frog species. All the animals that we see here living on and in the water or close to the water are here because they can find everything that they need to stay alive. Can you think of all the things that an animal needs to stay alive? Habitat is made up of all the needs of an animal. Oh, we've just had a, it looks like a mallard land in our wetland. 
Now a mallard is having all its needs met here in the wetland. <clears throat> it has water. All living things need water. It has food. Things like the invertebrates we were finding under the water that it dives for. So it has food, water, it has clean air around it, and it has shelter. And that shelter for, for birds like the mallard include ways in which they can feel safe from predators. So that includes flying, diving, and escaping from predators. If you and your family love to find out what it is you're looking at when you travel through the woods, check out a app for your phone called Seek. S-E-E-K. It's by iNaturalist and what's so great about it is you have it on your phone and then you bring it up to a plant or even um, if you have pictures of birds, animals, amphibians, and it recognizes what you're looking at. Here we're looking at a star flower and doesn't it look like a star flower with its shape of a star? Beautiful. June is a great month for exploring all the wildflowers native to our area. Here we have a red squirrel. Let's see if I can get a little closer. When observing wildlife, it's important to keep our distance. So my camera is zoomed in right now, so I'm not very close. Red squirrels are native, which means they are, they're from this area. And they don't hibernate over the winter, whereas their cousins, the chipmunks, do hibernate. And this squirrel is busy eating most likely the seeds of cones. They'll also eat little fruit, there it goes, or um, other nuts and seeds that it finds, and it will also eat even some bugs. I've hiked over to the dam trail at Hazelwood Lake, where the water that's coming out of Hazelwood Lake drains. And all of the water in our region, in the Lakehead region, drains into the lake, into Lake Superior. We are all in the um, Lakehead watershed. I can see some water beetles swimming down here. Beautiful day now. I see evidence of someone who's been busy at work here. Can you guess who might have chopped down this tree? It's a beaver. I'm coming to see if I can see any other evidence of beaver activity here. It's been busy chopping down the trees. Aha! I found the beaver lodge. So beavers, as we know, chop down trees using their teeth and they build lodges and dams. Now dams are built to block water, to fill an area and make the water deeper in that area so that they can build their lodge. And the lodge has entrances underneath the water and the the beavers then go up into the lodge through several different entrances and they've built it with 
trees that they've cut down and mud to hold it together. And here I have a beaver skull that I've brought with me. And you can see the front teeth of the beaver are very long. They keep growing the entire life of the beaver, of a beaver. And so they have to keep chewing on wood to keep them trimmed um, and not get too long. And here we have the beaver, a beaver pelt or beaver fur. And they produce their own oils that help repel water seen as they spend most of their life in the water swimming and they also have the soft fur underneath the downy fur that keeps them warm through the winter um, and and in the cold cold months well i hope you enjoyed your virtual field trip to hazelwood lake conservation area as much as i did turned out to be a gorgeous day and I hope that throughout the summer you too are able to visit one or more of our conservation areas to get out and explore and just take your time. Listen for the calls of birds and frogs, look for signs of animals and their tracks or, or chewed trees. Maybe you'll even get to see a bird or animal and just enjoy and I'd be happy to see any of the drawings that you've taken while looking at the things we've seen today or if you've written down lists of all the species that you've been able to identify or learn about, share them with me. Thank you. Have a great day.